Well, good morning, everybody. It's really great to be here to kick off today. Mark, thank you very much for that really kind introduction. I think first I would just like to start by thanking the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, your partnership has been amazing in co-sponsoring this event, the 12th annual event. And Mark was just sharing a little bit of history about how this came to be. And uh, I think that this level of partnership is something that is so desperately needed um, in the world that we're living in today. And the Chamber of Commerce has been such a huge supporter of FEMA's mission to make sure that we are doing everything we can collectively to help people before, during, and after disasters. For more than a decade, again, this conference has provided that critical forum for all of us to come together to discuss how these public-private partnerships can work together to continuously improve resilience across our nation. And I think as we are all seeing, climate change continues to drive a sharp and relentless incline in the amount of disasters that we are seeing. So these are the kinds of conversations, and you are the kind of partners that we need to help us navigate the challenging road that we face ahead. So to put a little bit of this in context, over the past three years in the United States, we have experienced 60 weather or climate-related events with losses that exceed $1 billion each. Just incredibly large numbers. And according to the Federal Reserve, one in 10 US employer firms have reported revenue losses related to a natural disaster in 2021. 38% of those have experienced a similar disaster before. So repetitive impacts on our businesses across the country. And a compounding factor to all of this is that disasters are often exasperating the inequities that we see across the nation, especially for our small and our minority-owned businesses. Another example from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, they found that small firms owned by people of color sustain losses from natural disasters at a disproportionately higher rate than other small businesses. Their losses, they comprise a large portion of their total revenues, making their return to normal operations even more challenging. As industry experts, all of you in this room, these are the kind of complex problems where your perspectives and your unique insights can help eliminate the inequities that we are seeing among the business community. Because to stay true to the American spirit, we cannot let small businesses be left behind. Now, it has also become, I think, quite clear in recent years that our threat landscape itself continues to evolve. What we consider to be normal has changed. There is no longer for us a wildfire season or a tornado season. There is no longer a defined timeline of weather patterns that we as an agency can plan for, let alone our emergency management partners at the state and local level. These conditions that we're experiencing, they're forcing the entire emergency management community to endure an operational tempo that right now never slows down. We're being asked to step up and lead in ways that we have never been asked to previously. And we need all of you to join us in this effort. As we saw last hurricane season, working with our business community ahead of major disasters, ahead of major weather events, can mean the difference between a recovery that takes months and one that takes years. So let's talk about Hurricane Ian for a few minutes. Because of the mitigation efforts that were put in place by the private sector, they helped before hurricane season to make sure that the impacted communities in Florida could recover faster. Through efforts like burying power lines, clearing vegetation, hardening power poles, all of these are examples of why power restoration took place much faster than some of the previous storms that we have responded to. 
This is the kind of work that is setting the resilience standard across our nation and one that we as a joint community should celebrate. And when it comes to the immediate aftermath of these events, local employers and major brands stepped in to meet the basic needs in Florida. A couple of other examples. Orlando's local business community, they came together to provide free ice, hot showers, and more to the impacted residents of their community. Regions Bank in Fort Myers, they committed $225,000 in grant funding for organizations that were providing disaster relief. They also provided financial services, all of this to help people and their businesses that were impacted by Hurricane Ian. And then there were major corporations like Verizon and Walgreens, Duke Energy and Elevance Health. They all generously donated their time, their services and money to help with the response and the recovery efforts. And when it came to restoring power, a historical mission in itself, lar large power companies came together, worked together to help get the lights back on. So to put that in perspective and why this partnership is so important, a day after landfall, there were 2.6 million customers that were without power. That's approximately 25% of all of the customers across Florida. Nine days after landfall, just nine days, that was down to just about 1% of the customers that were without power. That is incredible progress. That is partnership in action. And it was the hardworking hands of 44,000 workers from 32 states in the District of Columbia who came together, stepped forward quickly to help rebuild the state's energy infrastructure just an incredible feat and made such a difference to those communities that were so severely impacted. Now you may have also heard us talk about building nationwide resilience to these kinds of events. And this is not something that one agency or one organization can do alone. And this is the fact that I will be reaffirmed later today or that will be reaffirmed later today or shortly after me by one of my leaders, Victoria Salinas. Victoria is leading our resilience efforts at our agency. She's really driving our efforts in what we want to become and in, in our ambitious goals of making sure that we are addressing resilience across the nation, not just for FEMA, but the entire nation. And in the, although we are incredibly focused on finding new and innovative ways new and innovative solutions to help address the problems that we're facing today. Funding is always a critical part in bringing all of these ideas and these projects to reality. But we've been fortunate. Over the past few years, FEMA has received a significant amount of funding, a significant amount of bipartisan support from Congress to help fund unprecedented investments in our programs to help uh, reduce the impact through mitigation across the nation. Specifically, they've really uh, stepped up over the last two years to the tune of just about $7 billion, which is far more than FEMA has ever had to invest in resilience across the nation. But federal funding is only one part of the equation. Private sector investments are also just as important to help building community-level resilience. And this is because at FEMA, we believe that you are the key to our ability to help strengthen communities, to improve community level capabilities, and part of this is done through funding. The private sector, I feel, has a key opportunity to partner in one of our newest programs, the Community Disaster Resilience Zones, and of course, because we always need an acronym, it'll be called CEDARS. We're currently implementing this program through our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Mitigation Program, our BRIC program, our flagship mitigation program. This is an incredibly exciting time and an opportunity to again bring in the power of partnerships to help support our communities that are most in need. 
the CEDARS program is going to designate high-risk geographic zones to help us advance resilience across our nation's most vulnerable communities through targeted financial and technical assistance support. These zones, I believe, have the potential to be such a critical and vital tool to help us as a nation prioritize and focus our resilience and our mitigation efforts, not just in FEMA, but also for all of our federal partners, for private sector investments, for philanthropy, and our non-governmental organizations. But however, the systems and the infrastructure that we put in place to strengthen our interoperability across government and industry is just as important as the systems we put in place to harden the infrastructure we aim to protect. So a few more examples. Through our National Business Emergency Operations Center, or MBEOC, which I hope that you will join if you haven't already, members have access to real-time incident updates. They have contact information for government counterparts and training opportunities to help introduce you to how emergency managers operate. You can get more information about the resources that are available and what this organization does um, by going to fema.gov forward slash MBEOC. But there's also these resources at the state level. There are often business emergency operations centers which have a stronger pulse and a connection on what the needs are of their local business community. Our FEMA regional private sector liaisons, they regularly coordinate with these state and local BEOCs to be the link between federal assistance and the local customers who need it. This is just one example of how we are working across our agency in coordination with the business community to lean in on preparedness and building resilience. And I believe that one of the best ways that we can continue to measure our collective readiness is through disaster scenario exercises. And if you get an invitation to participate in an exercise, I really hope you will all take us up on that opportunity. They can be kind of fun, they can be creative, but they can really help drive us to think and have these thought-provoking conversations about the challenges that we think we might face that we might not be ready for. These types of exercises, they bring dozens of government and community partners together. They help identify existing gaps in our capability to respond, but they also help us anticipate. They help us anticipate what we think the future needs will be. And as I have talked many times with my team, you know, we can base a lot of our plans and a lot of our response efforts on historical risk, but what I'm seeing today is different than the risks that we faced 10 years ago. And so what are those risks going to be 10 years from now that we can use these types of opportunities, these exercises, to help us better understand where the future is going to go, what risks we're going to face, and how we can best mitigate against them. Uh, next month, as an example, we're facilitating an Idaho private sector disaster exercise in partnership with the Idaho Office of Emergency Management. This exercise, it's going to have over 40 participants from 30 different private sector companies and associations that will participate in a two-day exercise to simulate the catastrophic 9.0 earthquake along the full length of the Cascadia subduction zone vault. So that is 800 miles of impacted, potentially impacted communities from a significant earthquake along this fault zone. The exercise is gonna have a focus on food, on water, on fuel and on rail. It's gonna look at resource movement and coordination as well as the functionality of these systems to be able to share information, so critical in how we do things, to be able to share that information between the private sector, between our state partners and the federal agencies. And our Region 5 office, they're also hosting an exercise which is gonna cover uh, many of the Midwestern states and tribes. Their upcoming exercise is going to focus on a major power outage caused by an extremist group attack, another threat that we continue to see evolve and emerge over the last few years. Fifteen federal agencies are going to participate in this exercise along with our private sector partners from energy and health, as well as our tribes and many of our nonprofits 
they're going to come together to prepare for one of the most detrimental impacts to our critical infrastructure, a threat that we have already seen play out across the nation. But the way we lead preparedness initiatives across our own organizations is just as important. So I want to say, and I want to close by asking you one of the most important questions of the day. Actually, I have a few questions that I'm gonna ask you. Is your business ready? Have you identified what your business's unique risks are? Have you thought about what those risks are gonna be 10 years from now versus what you have faced in the past? Have you developed an emergency preparedness plan that is tailored to your business operations and your locations? One thing that I have learned is that we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to the way that we are approaching preparedness and resilience. Every community, every one of your businesses in different parts of the country has unique needs and tailor those business plans to those unique needs. Have you properly prepared your employees to be active participants in your business continuity plan? And more importantly, do you have a business continuity plan? If not, we also have tools to help you with these preparedness and these resilience efforts. We have an extensive suite of all hazard preparedness resources in our FEMA's Ready Business Toolkit to the FEMA Summer Ready Campaign that is focused on heat. Our priority is to provide all of you with the building blocks that you can use to build an adequate plan that addresses your unique risks before, during, and after disasters. And then when it comes to extreme heat, we're seeing that a lot right now. We're seeing it in the South and now move across the country. If you didn't know, heat is the deadliest weather threat in our country. So I urge you to find ways to better protect your workforce to educate your workforce on what the impacts are from heat, impacts that extend far beyond the business operations. And taking that first step again is simple. We can go to ready.gov again. This time, go to ready.gov forward slash business to find additional resources to help you protect your, your workers. So my goal for the time together this morning and for the rest of your event was to leave you with a few ways that you can join us in acting today to create a world that we want to see tomorrow. A world that we feel safe leaving behind for future generations. The future generations that we are all in this room going to count on to build upon the work that you are doing right here today. FEMA is really proud I am proud to be a partner with you, and we thank you for your commitment to our shared mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters. And I hope you leave this conference, this event, over the next few days with the tools and the knowledge to help you to continue to grow and build resilience within your organizations. Thank you.